Okay, uh, welcome to Ask John. I'm glad you are joining us today. Uh, this, I think this is the 23rd episode of Ask John, and it is the first Zoom meeting, Ask John. And uh, this, this, is a, uh, this is a show that was conceived of the idea that people would call in and ask John. I'm, I'm John Reichern, by the way. Come in and ask John. Uh, some financial questions, and that's how some of the first uh, episodes proceeded. And uh, but I just enjoyed asking questions myself, and then I began to uh, uh, introduce or, or meet with people that uh, had nothing to do with the financial, or you know, we all have something to do with financial, but uh, the topic wasn't necessarily financial. And um, so today is another exception to the rule of ask John. John's going to ask questions of of Ed Cressy. Uh, before I introduce Ed, uh, I, I, you know, I'm going to take this opportunity to show you around my office. So I've got my, my phone on my tripod, and let's see how this works. I think that you might have seen, there it is, it's not, not a big deal, and here I am, I'm located. Let's see, can you see that? What is that? Can you read that, Ed? I can read it. It says, hi, this is What do you see now? I see a horse. And another horse, and still another horse. Yeah, it's a remarkable there you go. part. Yeah, it's pretty there amazing. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's a bet. That's a Bev Doolittle. I really enjoy it. That's a great. I've seen it before. We've, I've been in your office before, and I was very impressed. This, this is my second time having the pleasure of being your guest. Uh, and the first time we met in your office, and I saw that painting, and I was very impressed by it then, and I'm impressed now. <laughs> well, I, I, I really enjoy. It. Oh, here's my my ark. That was a gift, and uh, I give my clients. Uh, sometimes I give clients an ark. Uh, not this particular one, but another one, and it's a, a representative of, uh, let's see, it represents uh, shelter from the financial storms to come. Oh, no, that's uh, good, that's good. I haven't received my arc yet, but you know, maybe when I'm a, maybe when I'm a five-timer, like on Saturday Night Live, you know? <laughs> maybe you're not a client yet, Ed. Maybe, <laughs> that's what, I gotta be a client, okay. <laughs> yeah, once, uh, I don't know, John, John, if you gaze upon my vast uh, wealth, I, I don't know if you'd be ready for something like that. So I don't know if I'm seen untold riches, rich the nature of which I'm in possession of. So maybe one of these okay. days. <laughs> so, uh, so let me introduce my guest, Ed Cressy, and Ed has been my guest in the past. Uh, Ed has a wonderful story to tell, and uh, I thought that it might be interesting to bring him back. He wrote a book recently, so now he is an author, and uh, this is an amazing book. I'm about 80% through it, and I can hardly wait to finish it, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I fear finishing it because it's going to be so sad. It's what, this is, I, I'm going to tell you this is one of those books that you, uh, that you don't want to put down, and when you're finished, you're kind of feeling bad because, uh, because it's over. But, uh, but you can read it again, right, Ed? Or, or maybe there'll be a sequel. John, that's so kind of you to say. Thank you so much. Yes. So Ed, Ed has a, a, an amazing story, and I think uh, I think when you hear Ed's, uh, Ed's history and his story and what he has uh, gone through and, uh, and, and what he has uh, accomplished, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a statement in his book, and uh, this is what I want to start off with all my guests today, all my listeners, my, my viewers. Uh, this is a... This is this is the story of what you can do uh, to change your life in, in whatever way you're unhappy with your life, you can change your life. If Ed can do what he's done, gone through what he's done, you you I'm telling you, you don't have any problems and uh, you have nothing to fear. And we're going to get on to this topic of fear a little later on. So, Ed, tell me a little bit about 
well, maybe uh, tell me why you were compelled to write a book. What, give, give me the history, uh, you know, a brief history of your life and, and uh, what, what was going on with you to, to finally, to finally uh, feel like you had to put this down. And by the way, you just, your, your writing style is amazing. It's just so, so easy to read and it's fun to read. Anyway, Ed, I'm, I'm, I'm finished complimenting you. <laughs> now you, now you're on your own. We keep going. Jonathan, <laughs> thank, thank you so much. You, you know, I like to summarize my life by saying that I am almost certainly the only person ever who was once arrested by the FBI, then turned my life around and was recognized with a community service award by the director of the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, you know, a remarkable story made possible by uh, a pursuit of spirituality, certainly by a number of amazing, remarkable people who helped me. And John, it's like you say, you know, for, uh, for all of you out there listening, you know, hopefully by the time that this show, this Ask John episode reaches you, hopefully the shelter in place will be over. Hopefully the pandemic will have passed. Hopefully we'll be on to healing. Uh, regardless if we're not or whatever other challenges you may may find you, you can overcome your challenges. You can push past your limitations. You can use your fear. You can use your struggles as sources of strength. And you can triumph. That's what I have found in my life. It can be true in yours. You know, John, 12 years ago today or maybe 13 years ago today, we would not have been having this conversation. 13 years ago today, I was living in a flop house hotel with a little sink in the corner where I would ash my cigarettes, wash my clothes, and urinate. I hadn't showered or brushed my teeth in months. I was high on methamphetamine. And I know I was high on methamphetamine that day 13 years ago because I was high on meth every day. Maybe not every day. Maybe some days I, I had spent all my money and I'd run out of food stamps that I would use to buy steaks and trade the steaks to my dealer for meth. You know, but if I couldn't find a way to get meth, if I could possibly, I would be high on meth. I'd been a methamphetamine addict for 11 years in 2007. I had thrown away a job with Genentech, which went on to be the number one company in America to work for, according to Fortune magazine. Genentech treated me very well. I was on a career path, worked there five years. It was so good to me. I threw that career away. I threw away a beautiful dream home in San Francisco. I threw away my life savings. I threw away my beloved dog and all my relationships. Everyone who tried to help me, everyone who loved me, I pushed them away in favor of sinking into methamphetamine psychosis, which meant that I would hear these disembodied voices jabbering at me constantly, 24 hours a day, threatening to kidnap and torture me to death. I would believe in these vast FBI conspiracies trying to pin 9-11 on me because I believed I had inadvertently befriended a 9-11 hijacker. And thus there was this uh, global uh, conspiracy slash cover-up involving me. This was the world I was sunk into. I carried a loaded 357 pistol almost everywhere I went because I was afraid of the people I thought were after me. Um, John, I'm just touching the iceberg of where my life was at. Fortunately, in 2007, after serving months in jail, after spending nights in homeless shelters, after spending years in destitution and methamphetamine psychosis, amazing people inspired me to find the strength to get and stay clean. I was inspired to work incredibly hard at spirituality, at self-improvement, at service to others. These things became the cornerstones of my recovery. Thus, I was able to bring some value of good to my communities. I became a volunteer first responder. I became a community servant. And thankfully, I'm so grateful to the FBI because despite having quit meth, I continued to experience a form of psychosis, a lingering form of psychosis that, that went on many years after I quit meth. And to, to be honest, even to, this, even to this very day, I'll experience episodes, uh, flashbacks to the, the schizophrenia-like condition I, I had, and I'll experience these otherworldly symptoms. I've learned to turn all of it into a blessing. 
I've learned to take all my fear, all my struggles, all my suffering. I've learned to transform those into a way to bring value to the world around me. Thanks to the FBI, thanks to my communities, thanks to many amazing people. John, you yourself included and your incredible listeners, I'm able to bring value to the world around me. I, today I volunteer inside maximum security prisons and county jail, helping persons transform their lives, helping incarcerated persons find employment and start businesses so they can uh, not recidivate. I'm uh, just very, very blessed, John. I'm very fortunate. And to have come from a place as dark as I was in, in that methamphetamine psychosis, and the addiction and the destitution, for me to have come out of that place, I can tell you with a great de degree of confidence, Sean, you can do it too. I know your circumstances are very challenging right now in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of whatever you have going on. You can escape, you can overcome, you can use your fear, you can use your struggles as a source of triumph. And you, thank you, Ed. So, Andy, uh, you, the, the last time we talked, you showed me uh, a, a picture, uh, actually two pictures, and uh, and I think this picture kind of represents, in a way, your psychosis, if you will. And uh, one was a picture of Omar, somebody named Omar, and another picture was someone who was uh, identified as a possible terrorist, 9/11, and uh, you said. They, they look like the same guy. And, uh, and when you said that, you, you had a very high degree of confidence that, that was the, the, those were two pictures of the same guy. And I looked at it and uh, I tried to see it through your eyes. Uh, I couldn't, my friend. They, they looked, you know, they're generally, generally the same, then maybe the same nationality, maybe the same age. But um, I would never put the two together. But in, in your and, and I think you, there's there's something going on that that you that you have a certainty about things, and uh, that that's that's that you also know is incorrect. And um, it's it's <laughs> uh, well, these Boolean operators, you know, and they are so real to you. And um, and I get that, but I I didn't. It was hard for me to understand. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the bullying operators in a moment. But, but, uh, but this guy Omar uh, and the terrorist, uh, it, it, that was a really good way for me to grasp your, your certainty about something that so clearly to me is very, very unlikely. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, basically, John, uh, just to back up a little bit, in the year 2000, I was at the height of sort of my material possessions. I was with Genentech and I had my BMW motorcycle and my many relationships. Uh, at the same time in the year 2000, I was also binge using methamphetamine every weekend. At the same time, all that was going on, I had a, ho I had the, a hobby which was kickboxing. I used to do a lot of kickboxing. I had the opportunity to go to Thailand to train in kickboxing where the sport originated with some of the professionals there. I wasn't a professional myself, but I, I got to train with some of the professionals. I met the man who we'll call Omar. This is the man to whom you're referring. Omar, when I was in Bangkok, Thailand, he was my roommate at this kickboxing camp. Just a nice guy, a nice uh, man of uh, Middle Eastern descent, a, a Muslim guy. Uh, he was from France, just a, a nice dude. And we got to know each other a little bit. What happened after that was I returned to San Francisco. I went from using methamphetamine every weekend to using it every day. That job with Genentech went away. I threw it away. My kickboxing hobby, I threw that away. As I began to sink into that methamphetamine psychosis and hear the disembodied voices and see the helicopters following me and pictures of myself in newspapers and magazines. As all that started to happen, I, got, I was gripped with the belief that that guy Omar had been a 9-11 hijacker. And like you say, John, you can look at the pictures of, of my friend Omar and the hijacker and you know, let me, let me interrupt here just, just for a moment. I think we'll be able to put those pictures up here. So when we edit this, so, you can. so we can, 
Yeah. Yeah. You won't be able to put the picture of Omar up because out of you know respect to his privacy, I don't like to show. His picture. Yeah, because he's okay. I mean, by all accounts he's just some normal guy. I don't know if he wants <laughs> some his picture up there next. Okay. To his okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, the, the point is, John, when we get sunk into these fears, and when we get gripped with anxiety about the future, and when we don't know what's going to happen, or when we don't know the meaning of what is happening as so many of us are experiencing right now, it is so easy to get mired in these beliefs. It is so easy to identify with our, our anxieties. It's so easy to make the world of fear and the world of anxiety more real than actual reality. And as you know, John, our circumstances don't really matter so much. What matters is the meaning to which we ascribe our circumstances, right? So even if I had, you know, let's take that, that far out possibility that Omar had been a 9-11 hijacker, okay? Even if that were true, that doesn't mean that the FBI has architected some vast conspiracy against me. You know, a lot of people knew these hijackers. A lot of people encountered them. I certainly had nothing to do with, with terrorism or anything illegal outside of the drugs I was doing. But you so, took that on yourself. I did, John. So I, I decided in my mind somewhere, I decided that because I had known the 9-11 hijacker and inadvertently befriended him, everybody was out to get me. My family. So it was, it was a, it was a, uh, uh, it was like, it was kind of like, a, it was kind of like a double fake. You know, first of all, it wasn't Omar. And, yeah. uh, and, and even if it wasn't Omar, that, that didn't mean that the FBI was out to get you. Exactly. And I, and I know, and I know that you, you seem to be going through different phases where you're going to be a good citizen and turn him in or, or, or you're the perpetrator and you're going to get caught. <laughs> so that was part of your psychosis, I guess. That was part of my struggle. I, I struggled mightily with the story of Omar. Even years after I got clean off meth, I felt uh, very badly because I, I believed at times that Omar had been this hijacker and that I was failing in my duty to bring this information to the American public who deserved to know. Then on the other hand, I thought, okay, well, I would believe I'm a top secret FBI undercover operative. And therefore I have to keep the story of Omar a secret in order to protect counterterrorism efforts. You know, I would struggle with all this, John, and it became more real to me than reality. And this is what a lot of people I think probably experience today. You know, we, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So we unfortunately go down that path of ascribing a, a dark meaning to it or a fearful meaning. And we, we don't, when we don't know what's going to happen, we can just as easily assign a positive outcome as a negative outcome. I made the mistake for many, many years of assigning that negative outcome. It set me back. It hurt me personally. But what's even worse is it limited my ability to bring value to the world around me. When I was sunk in this anxiety, when I was sunk in the fear, when I was sunk in the, the doubt and the paranoia, although I was bringing some good to the world around me, I, I held myself back from bringing my truest, best self to the world. Thanks to the FBI, thanks to uh, many individuals, again, such as yourself, thanks to my sponsors, my mentors, my communities, the nonprofits I work with, all my friends, my incredible family, thanks to all these people. I'm, able to overcome that and hopefully bring some value to the world around me. Yes. And, and, and that's, this is wonderful. And, and the, uh, the, the, you know, the truth is that we all, we all suffer from that same malady, if you will. Uh, this, this idea of fear. Uh, I know that, um, you know, I'll get a phone call uh, from a client or, or, or someone else and I, and I, and I don't know what it's about. And the first thing is a defensive thing. Uh, oh my God, you know, what, <laughs> what's going on now? You know, what, what is the problem? And um, I've kind of learned in my, I've learned in my age to, to accept that that's how I'm gonna react and to dismiss it just as quickly as I can and, and think, and think oh, and so I allow myself to think of the worst thing that could happen and I put that away, and then I think about all the positive things that could come of this, whatever the situation is. And so I, I, don't, I don't, don't like to be Pollyannish about it, because 
you know, bad things happen. But even the worst of the things that happen, and I can tell you some things that have happened with, you know, with, with client situations and just life experiences, uh, even the worst uh, can have a positive outcome. And we just have to look at, it, it, is, it is so important to look at that, to, let, to put the fear aside and to move along and go look for whatever good could come up or whatever situation you're in. Exactly. Like uh, Napoleon Hill, I'm going to probably butcher what he wrote a little bit, but Napoleon Hill said something like, even in the worst circumstances are the seeds of something of greater or equal value. So, you know, John, I used to believe that people were following me, bent on kidnapping me, uh, hitting me in the head, throwing me into the trunk of some car, loading me onto an airplane on some deserted airstrip, flying me off to an underground dungeon where people would stick needles into my eyes to prevent me from escaping, and that I would live the rest of my decades being tortured to death slowly. This was my reality. This was the fear I allowed myself to sink into. Did you, did you ever have any experience remotely like that, where you were accosted in any way? In my mind, yes, because John- Well, no, I mean- in no. actuality, but no. In actuality, no. And that's, you, you, hit on, you hit the nail right on the head, John. I would see things that were of an ambiguous nature, and I would assign them meanings that were highly negative. When in fact, so John, you know, let, let's say the CIA was following me. You know, let, let's yeah. just put that out there. In my, in my wild delusional fantasies, I thought the CIA, even if that were true, it was up to me to decide, you know, whether they were out to get me or whether you know the CIA, if I was gonna live a fantasy life, I might as well live a fantasy life that the CIA has recruited me as a top secret operative to help further the cause of democracy and freedom. I could have just as easily chose that path, but I chose the dark path. I chose the path of negativity. I chose the path of fear and anger. I could have just as easily chosen the path of love and optimism. Now, you know, it goes, part of it is human nature and human psychology because it's, as it's been explained to me, in our prehistoric times, if we were sitting outside our cave and we, there was a beautiful sunset and we missed the sunset, that's okay. There will be another sunset tomorrow. But in our prehistoric times, if we're sitting outside our cave and we missed a saber-toothed tiger, <laughs> then we have a serious problem. So as human beings, we're, we're sort of hardwired to look for the negativity, to look for the fear, to look for what could be wrong, to look for the danger. That's programmed into us because our ancestors who passed along their genes passed that along. Still, we can overcome that. We, we need to learn to wait in patience, wait patiently. Or find, yes. yeah, and, and find, exactly, and find a form of spirituality. Find something not of yes. a material nature that we can grasp on, yeah. whether it's God or whether it's uh, Jesus or Buddha or uh, Hinduism or whether it's gratitude or uh, being of service to others. Anything of a non-material nature that we can grasp onto as a means to see that light and stay away from that dark path. Then we can use fear to our extreme advantage. We can look back on the fear in our lives. We can look back on overcoming our challenges and triumphing over our struggles. Uh, it's like lifting weights. You know, we, we've lifted weights and you lift more than you can. You've got a little too, more, too much weight or a little bit more weight than you can handle, but that's what makes you stronger. And our lives are like that. When we overcome the fear and the negativity and the struggles, we can look back and see, this is what gives us the strength that we have today. And we... Even in these very challenging times, we have the opportunity to choose our path, to control our thoughts. It's hard work. Believe me, it's very hard work. But we can choose a path of controlling our thoughts, of pursuing spirituality, of self-improvement, of service to others. And despite these challenging times, we can triumph. And, and we will. And we will. Tell me what, tell me about the Boolean, the Boolean operators. Is that a, is that a, uh, 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 what, what, first of all, what's the reality of that term, Boolean operators? Oh, uh, Boolean operators, so when you do a search in your search engine, when you go into Google or something, and you write, uh, you know, ask John and finance, 
right? If you were going to do a search, if you're looking for to, to how to look up your business, you would write, ask John the word and, and you would put and in capital letters. And that and, the word and is called a Boolean operator. And it's basically, uh, it has to do with true or false. So when Google- It could looks, be, or you could, you could replace it with or, or, and then it would have a different- Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You could also replace it with, with the word not, N-O-T. So words like and or not, true or false. Uh, greater than, greater than, less than, equal to, yeah. Okay, those are the Boolean operators, okay. Yes, and basically what they do is they help us search. They help us search more effectively. So what happened with me is in the year 2003, I began hearing disembodied voices. And they sounded like celebrities. They sounded like my family. They sounded like uh, the director of the FBI. They sound, John, these, vo these voices I heard, they were as real as your voice now, if not more so. I mean, these voices were very, very real to me. So I named them the Boolean operators, or they named themselves the Boolean operators. And there's a whole story about it. You know, the Booleans are actors and the operators are storytellers or playwrights. And believe me, John, I could go on for far longer than your audience wants to listen to this. But let's just say for years and years, I was immersed in the world of these disembodied voices that I called the Boolean operators. And they were real. They were real. These were not just voices. These were real. They were more real than you, John. I'm, I mean, yeah. I, they were... No, right now, I'm just an image to you. Right now, I'm just an image, and I'm 3,000 miles away. So, yeah, um, yeah they, so those, they were right there with you. Yeah, yeah they, were, they were my whole life. And, uh, you know, for a long time, I chose to see them as these hateful, uh, negative things and, and just wanted nothing more for them to go away. Um, after a while, when I got clean off meth, they didn't go away. They didn't go away because I'd smoked so much meth and, and I used so many drugs for so long that the, the, what most people would call psychosis was I, I, there probably to stay. And, you know, even to this day, the, uh, the Boolean operators are part of my life. Uh, They're still there. Oh, yeah. yeah even today, you know, John, they can't hurt me. They, they can't <laughs> hurt me. The only, you know, and they, the, they can only hurt me in so far as I choose to see them as a threat. Or and and it seems like it seems like in reading your book, in some cases they were they were very beneficial. They were they were trying to help you. I like my. They got to be my best friends. They got to be my spouse. I, uh, I <laughs> yeah, in yeah, the yeah. book, and it's kind of a yeah. joke, but in, in reality, yeah. on, on Thanksgiving Day, and yeah, uh, and they were jealous. <laughs> they, 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 they were they, jealous. Yeah, yeah. They, they were jealous. <laughs> but uh, they're they're okay, you know. And John, the point is, you you can hear you know a person like me can hear disembodied voices. A person like me can even to this day fall prey to beliefs that there is some, uh, you know, CIA something going on, on there. A person like me can, can have these things go on, but still bring value to my communities. I, I still to this day volunteer inside maximum security prisons, like, like we were discussing. I still, uh, I, I published articles in the Washington Post, one of the most highly regarded uh, uh, sources of journalism in the world for I think over a hundred years, um, you know, I'm still given opportunities to be of service. I can still bring a great deal of value to the world. Not, you know, not, uh, not Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King's value, nothing like that, but I can still do some part to improve the world around me. The point is, and this is kind of the theme of my book or one of the themes, second chances benefit the giver as much as the receiver, if not more so. The second chances that society gave me, they helped me, yes, but they also helped society because I'm going and I'm giving back to my communities. It's not true in every case, but John, when we take a hard look at second chances, when we look at the persons who are afforded a chance to turn their lives around, when they're given uh, a hand up, when people are, are sh given the same opportunities that I've been given, or, or even not as great as the opportunities, I was given a lot of opportunities, many, many of us, go on to contribute to society. Many people do as much as me, if not far more. And many people have overcome challenges that look like what I've been through uh, to be kind of a walk in the park or, uh, or, or you know, a piece of cake. So John, second, when we give second chances to persons who've been incarcerated, when we give second chances to persons who've struggled through homelessness or who have uh, made mistakes in life, we help those people, but we also help ourselves. So uh, you've mentioned a couple of times service to others, and uh, that brings back the 
you know, the, the, the motto of, of Rotary and uh, my Rotary friends that are listening, I am certainly have, have uh, grabbed onto that. Our motto is service above, service above self. And, uh, and we do a lot of things in Rotary to help, you know, to help others. Uh, I recall having a conversation with you about uh, what, what can we do if I, if, if, if I could just, I don't know how far back we'd have to go, like six or seven or eight years, and, and you and your in the in the depths in the depths of your depravity. Uh, if if I was uh, a good friend, family member, or just just somebody who wanted to help you, uh, what could I have done? What could I do? What could we do today for someone in similar circumstances? Well, the easiest and, and one of the best things is to pray. Is to pray and send good thoughts. Thoughts have power. Thoughts are energy. Thoughts definitely have the power to harm, but thoughts also have the power to heal. You can pray, you can think positively for people. That does a lot. You can do that right now, right from where you're watching. All it takes is the effort of directing your thinking, which, which can be a lot of effort sometimes, but you can do that right now. As far as uh, people are often asking me what's a more practical way to help others, the, the best, uh, the people who helped me the most were people whom I wanted to be like. Okay, that means if, if a person was uh, wealthy or a person had a lot of material possessions, that really didn't matter so much to me because I had had those things too. I'd been given wealth, I'd been given material possessions, but those things didn't matter to me because I wasn't self-confident. I wasn't a person who felt fulfilled. I didn't feel like I was bringing value to the world around me. I didn't think of myself as a worthwhile person. So when you, the individual who's trying to help someone struggling with addiction, when you come across to me as someone who has confidence in yourself, when you come across as someone who's improving yourself, when you come across as someone who is being of service and bringing good to the world, I look at you in my addiction and I think, wow, that's who I want to be like. I want to be like that person. And now when you offer me advice, I'm more likely to take it. Because advice, as we know, is only going to get us to the place where the advice giver has arrived. All right? So to use a financial example, John, if I was to say to you, John, you know what? I'm broke again, man. My, my last 10 investments all tanked. I can't pay my rent. I, I'm, I'm busted again, John. But hey, let me give you some financial advice. No matter what advice I might give, you're not likely to take it because of the place I'm coming. Even if I were to give you good advice, you're not likely to take it because of where I'm coming from. Usually when we advise someone to quit doing drugs, often in general, that's usually good advice, right? In, in, in by and large, it's good advice. But if I'm coming from a place where I'm deeply unhappy, I got all these problems, Oh man, I can't, you know, I can't deal with anything. I'm stressed out. I, uh, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't like my, my self image. I don't like my career, but Hey, let me advise you to quit doing drugs. It's very similar to that financial advice, right? So you talked about, you talked about people in, I guess it's in, uh, is it, was it AA or, uh, whatever it was, uh, that you had a sponsor and, uh, and, I think the sponsor did you some good, but he, you know, he had his own issues. And how, how does that work out when you, uh, that must be very discouraging when you, when you're putting so much faith in someone else. And well, let me ask a different kind of question. Uh, how sh should we be putting f faith in others or should we be putting our faith in God? I, that's up to each individual to decide. I'm, I'm certainly in no position to, to, instruct anyone as to whether to have faith or, or not. For, for me, that, that faith in God, that, that always comes first. However, uh, it was individuals that got me to that point of having faith in God. You know, a good so story you, is... You, uh, had, you, had a, you had a sponsor uh, that was having his own... Of course, when you go to AA, I, I assume that it's you're all, you're, everyone's in the same boat, right? Uh, and then you know, uh, you know, they say you don't go into AA on the wings, you don't fly in on the wings of victory. <laughs> you know, not, 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 <laughs> so, like a so yeah, so I, I get it. So what? So uh, so your sponsor is going to be someone who's 
it's suffering from the same malady that you're suffering from. And so then what? Well, the sponsor has overcome. You know, the sponsor has found the way to, to triumph over seemingly hopeless circumstances. A sponsor has so found the solution. So your sponsor, uh, your sponsor, after some time relapsed, and then this, this person overcame again and became your sponsor again? Or how, I forget how that turned out. Yeah, I talked, which were, this, uh, this all happened when I got clean for one of the first times back in 06. The person you're describing, uh, just for your audience's benefit, he was, I think, my first ever sponsor. And he, he relapsed back to uh, crack cocaine, I think it was, after he started sponsoring me. And then I relapsed back to methamphetamine. The point is, that person, that sponsor today, we just talked on the phone the other day. You know, we're close friends now. He's, uh, his daughter is doing incredibly well in college. He's married. He's helping many, many people. So, you know, it's possible to turn one's life, life around. And this was a guy who, uh, this person I'm describing, he was living on the streets, uh, smoking crack. He was homeless. And now he's contributing to society. So my story is just one of many, many people. Um, you know, just to get back, John, to uh, when I quit meth, along with the psychosis I experienced, I was suicidal. I, I would fantasize about uh, writing an email, a mass email, and BCCing everybody I knew, and hitting the send button, and then walking to the Golden Gate Bridge, because I lived not far away from the Golden Gate Bridge, and, and leaping off, you know, with, and if you know San Francisco, you know the city of San Francisco, the jeweled lights, the beauty of the San Francisco night skyline is right there from the Golden Gate Bridge, and just, uh, you know, flying to the bottom of the sea. That's what I fantasized about, man. Or, or later when I got my 357 pistol, I would fantasize about putting it in my mouth and yanking the trigger because I just didn't want to live, man. You know, this, I, I didn't want to die, but I, there was, you know, there was nothing to life because drugs were such an important part of my life and drugs were such an important solution to me. The point is, uh, John, I met a meditation teacher who taught me not only to meditate and pursue spirituality, but he also instilled in me certain beliefs about suicide. He instilled in me the belief that suicide would lead to regression through many past lifetimes. And I didn't want regret. I didn't even want to relive this life, much less regress through past lifetimes. Yeah. Yeah. Go back to, go back two levels and start over again. Thank you very much. I want to know part of that. So the point is, although the, the, the med although it's the spirituality is the number one thing in my life now, God is the number one thing in my life. God, you know, whatever the term you want to use for God is for, for me, that spiritual presence is number one. It was that meditation teacher who instilled in me the belief to pursue that spirituality, to not leap off the Golden Gate Bridge, to not yank the trigger of that 357 pistol. And it was individuals that led me, and not just my meditation teacher, many, many others too. But uh, when you ask, is it more important to, to think about humans or the spiritual? For me, it's the spiritual, but I never would have gotten to that place of spirituality had it not been for the human beings who played such a beautiful, wonderful, important part in my life. You're absolutely inspiring. Um, I want you to tell me, tell us how... Uh, this book had to be very cathartic for you, I'm guessing, and uh, and probably I'm, I'm get, as much as others will benefit from it. I, I imagine that you uh, you certainly have benefited from it yourself. But you, what I what I was interested to know is that you always wanted to be an author. When did you first know that you wanted to be a writer? John, I'm sorry, you cut out. You were just. You were just about to ask me to tell you something. When, when did you first realize that you wanted to be a writer? I was maybe, uh, I don't know, 12, maybe 13. When I was, uh, when I was a kid, I was, I was just a weird kid. I couldn't fit in with, uh, I couldn't fit in with, you know, I was very uncoordinated, couldn't play sports or compete in the uh, gym class. I was very sensitive. I would cry very easily. I, I loved to read. I would escape into worlds of fantasy. There were a lot of books in my home. I was very fortunate, so I grew up with a love of reading. Because I would read a lot, and because I was so immersed in the fantasy world, and I loved so much to escape into fantasy, I read a lot, so I got to kind of understand how words should look on a page. 
I began to understand how sentences should be structured and how paragraphs and all that kind of work. At least I got some sense of it, not, you know, not Jane Austen or Hemingway or anything like that, but I developed uh, some ability to, to write well. When I was 12 or 13 or however many years old, the, some of the first times I felt worthwhile as a human being was when the English teacher would bring me to the front of the room to read aloud a story I had written. And then, you know, I remember the bullies who would punch me on the playground would, would sometimes clap me on the shoulder after that English class and tell me they liked my story. Or the, uh, you know, the popular kids who I couldn't fit in with, who I felt ostracized from, they, I would feel from them, from them coming to measure respect because I had written a story and, and I could do something well. Writing was one of the first things I felt good at. Unfortunately, when I was 14, or soon afterwards came another way to feel like I was good at something, drinking. You know, I got drunk for the first time when I was 14 years old. And although my dream had always been to be a writer, that took discipline. That took perseverance. That took self-confidence. That took applying myself towards a goal and towards a dream. Whereas drinking, boom, you know, that's instant, man. That's straight from the bottle. And now all of a sudden I feel like a worthwhile person. I can put my arm around uh, the young woman who I was too afraid to talk to when, when I wasn't drunk. I could, uh, I could tell jokes that people would laugh with instead of laugh at. You know, drinking gave me that feeling that I was somebody, man. You know, drinking made me feel like, oh, I, I, can, I can interact with people around me. And from there, I got very quickly, 16 years old, heavy drinking turned into heavy drug using. Very soon, you know, 17, 18, I was really heavily into drugs. And that lasted for about 20 years. Um, and the point is, you know, I never really liked getting high. Well, uh, what I should say is I never really liked being high because I would get so high that, that I couldn't interact. I would push myself past the point of being able to interact with people. You know, I would get paranoid or, uh, or so self-conscious when I was so high on, on marijuana or cocaine. But I, I loved being that person who knew how to get high. I loved being the person who knew the phone call to make, who knew the code words to use, who knew the paraphernalia, how to, how to utilize the paraphernalia. That made me feel like somebody. And, and drugs were never really a means to get high. It's kind of interesting. One, one of the things that I was hearing you say a while ago is the connection with others, the acceptance and so forth. You know, you have the drink, you're connected. Um, but it, it occurs to me that later on, most of your high was uh, in solitude. That's exactly right. Yeah, John, because that fantasy world when I was, you know, when I was a kid and I used to, uh, I used to be in that fantasy world in my head. Uh, when I look back, I was always making that reality. So, you know, it, when it was a twisted, terrible form of reality, but I would do so much cocaine that I would believe the police helicopters were landing on the roof and the SWAT team was rappelling down the side of the building to crash through the window and drag me away. Uh, you know, these were, I would see, look out the, peer out the window uh, through the blinds and see the car lights flashing on and off, sending coded messages to the paratroopers that were hiding <laughs> in the bushes. You know, th this is what, what I would always get to. Every cocaine binge, I would get there because uh, it was just a way of immersing myself in this false reality. It was a way yeah. of bringing myself back to that kid who... Well, what, what strikes me, Ed, is in reading that, how much uh, it was like, it was, it was torture for you that you went down this path that was unproductive, but but give you, uh, you know, some kind of pleasure or some kind of release or some kind of um, uh, distance from, uh, if, you know, from the reality that you didn't like. And at the same time, uh, you were also denying yourself the pleasure of the writing that you really wanted to do. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's so wonderful that you, uh, you know, so it's like, okay, so th that's, uh, all right, so you gave that up. Well, this is the okay. So you're you're back you're back to writing, which is another escape, I'm sure. And uh, and 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 it's a but it's a good healthy escape. I'm so glad that you made it. That's all I'm saying. I'm so glad I, that you made it, and you benefit from it, and we all do as well. Well, thank you. That's, that's very kind of you to say. Yeah, thanks, John. And for me, it was that place of comfort. Comfort does not equal happiness. So I was comfortable in that cocaine addiction, peering through the blinds, listening for the helicopters. I knew that place. 
And for people today who are forced to shelter in place or forced to social distance, you know, the, the, one of the dangers is we get to that place of comfort. We, we, we understand our fear. We know our anxiety. We, we live in it. And we know we can survive another day being mired in that fear. So we get comfortable. And the human mind is, or the human brain is programmed for survival, not for happiness. So we, you know, I would survive, I could survive from day to day in that place of paranoia, in that place of addiction. Whereas to become a writer, to pursue my dream, I had no idea whether I could survive that. You know, I, I was afraid of failing at being a writer, but I was probably even more afraid of being successful. So for all of us today, you know, we, we, the dangers, we get very comfortable in fear. We go through fear today. We go through fear. We were in fear yesterday. We're going to go through fear tomorrow. So we know that fear. We know we can survive from day to day in fear. Whereas we lift ourselves out of fear. We don't know that we can survive. But, you know, I we, hope that I hope that we, I hope that as a as a society, we, we, we do not fall into, a, you know, we're, 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 all, we're all sheltered in place. And I hope that we do not fear a release from that prison. Well, we can still, even if we fall in that place, the good news is we can transform. You know, there's, uh, there's transform. a story about the, a yeah. butterfly. Can I tell the story about the butterfly? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So the, it's yeah. a quick story, but it's, a good, it's worth hearing. There's a person okay. walking through. Yeah, we're, we're kind of running out of time. But, you, but what, yeah, that's good. One more story. That's perfect. It's a quick story. It's a, it's a good one to yeah. end on. There's a person uh, walking through the woods who encounters a butterfly. The butterfly is emerging from a cocoon and it's struggling. The butterfly is fighting, fighting. It can't get out of the cocoon. So the person takes out a knife and tries to cut the cocoon, thinking that that will help the butterfly. But actually, it harms the butterfly because it's that struggle to free itself from the cocoon that gives the butterfly's wings their strength to fly. And we as human beings, sometimes we need that struggle. Sometimes we need to escape from our fear, from our anxiety, in order to give our wings the strength to carry us aloft. Excellent. Ed, uh, I think we're going to be able to put the, the cover of your book up on the screen here, and we'll leave it there long enough for people to get a good grasp of it. Uh, what's the title of the book? It's called uh, My Addiction and Recovery. Okay. Very and, uh, this Tell us it all. I, I'm going to... I want to remind you and everyone else, especially I want to remind you that this is your first book. Indeed. It's the first, and, it's the and, first book that's barely, that's somewhat readable. Uh, yeah, I've written other books, well, but the, nothing the, 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 the implication that it, it is not your last book. Oh, I, thank I, you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, I'm John. Looking, I'm looking for more. All right, appreciate that, man. Okay. Um, Ed, a virtual handshake. And thank you so much, and thank all of you for joining us today. Um, there will be more. Tune in again. Take care. Bye now.